Welcome to the amazing Digital Circus, a cheery and colorful place filled with fun and adventure. Once you go in, you'll never want to leave. Or you might, but you're not going anywhere fast. So, what is the Amazing Digital Circus? So far, it's just a pilot and concept art, but elsewise, it's a budding web series created by Gooseworks. The show involves the titular Amazing Digital Circus, where wacky characters go on crazy adventures. Well, no, that's actually not what it's about. In reality, the show is about a bunch of humans trapped inside of a simulation of an old computer game run by crazy AI mastermind Kane. Nobody remembers who they are, and pretty much everyone's become complacent. If, if are starting to lose it. And today, we'll be taking a look at the tunishly delightful freak show that makes up the main cast, along with a few additions. Now, most of my information is coming from the show itself, and a few tidbits provided by the creators. So if, like, Gooseworks comes out and confirms something that I forgot to mention, oops. Well, let's begin. Let's start with our main lead, Pomni, the living embodiment of a mental breakdown and the newest member of the gang. Pomni cannot remember her name, she cannot remember her face, but she can seemingly remember how she got into the digital circus through a headset which she tries and fails to remove. Pomni is nervous and anxious and, yeah, like I said, careening towards a breakdown. She doesn't really grasp what's going on and isn't taking this thing quite too well. That being said, I find one of the most notable things about Pomni is that she's actually rather courageous. As frightened and freaked out as she is at the situation around her, there is a point during the pilot where she runs away from a former resident and current Eldritch, leaving fellow Carney Agatha behind in the process. However, she then bucks up and goes back to her, and while this can be seen as cowardly, I find the fact that she was able to fight her fight-or-flight reflex and go back to be a sign that she's a little more resilient than she seems. Unfortunately, her fixation to leave, for understandable reasons, leads to distraction, dead ends, and hopelessness. Pomni also has quite the sailor mouth, and I can only assume she says all seven of the words you cannot say on TV. Though unfortunately, they're all blocked by censors. As for notable relationships, and I say this with only the pilot in mind, Pomni has already shown a bit of a friendship with Ragatha, albeit strained by her getting distracted on the exit instead of getting her help, and spent at least a little time with Jax. Kane seems particularly interested in her, but likely that's because she's new blood. Also, Gooseworks confirmed that she is 25, and that number jumped to 34 so fast. One last note, but there is a scene where Pomni runs up to a desk with a headset on it, and since she mentions a headset and since she reacts to it by having a mini mind break, it's possible this is the headset that she came in through. We will see it again at the end of the pilot when we back out of the digital circus to reveal the office and the headset. And maybe this isn't to be taken too seriously, but does this mean that their entire body is sucked into the digital world? Disturbing but I guess that makes sense, because elsewise, you would think someone would eventually come along and just unhook them from the machine. Moving on to our next character, let's discuss Ragatha since I brought her up before. Ragatha is a human-sized ragdoll who seems to be based off of Raggedy Ann. She's a friendly and downright big sisterly gal who immediately takes Pomni under her wing. While Ragatha is quick to put on a smile and blow things off, trying to keep a cool head and relaxed demeanor, it's clear that at least some of this is a front, as she's aware of what will happen if they lose it in the digital circus. Something that I will bring up later. In fact, just bringing it up and thinking about it is the one thing that truly shakes that facade. That is, until this eyesore shows up. Even when Ragatha is battered and corrupted, she manages to somewhat keep up the front. Nah, it's cool, just go get Kane. These things happen sometimes. She doesn't even seem to hold it against Pomni, though she does seem visibly upset or sad once Pomni is unable to pull through for her, or perhaps just upset because she got totally battered. And while this might roll over into the show as a point of contention between the two, I sort of think that she's the type of person who just might let that go and hide the hurt. And since we basically have her relationship with Pomni covered, let's address the others. While Ragatha gets pranked by Jax both in the character teasers and in the show, she doesn't seem to be as much of a target for him as the others. Jax not only makes her aware of the prank, perhaps so he can get a rise out of her, 
but he willingly elects to hang out with her and Pomni. That's not to say that the two are friends, but again, the two are shown conversing quite a bit, and that's saying a lot considering this guy. We don't really know about Ragatha's relationship with the others, except for Kofmo the clown. As Ragatha's being attacked, she ends up spilling that they didn't always get along and that he called her out for fake laughing at his jokes, so it sounds like towards the end things got a little rough between them. That Ragatha tried to keep the peace and Kofmo saw straight through it. Now, since Ragatha is both so friendly and so good at hiding her feelings outside of, you know, discussing existentiality, I have a hard time believing Ragatha couldn't effectively fake laugh at a joke. So either Kofmo's jokes were really bad, distasteful, or Rule 34 adjacent. At least, that's my headcanon. Long story short, Ragatha is a sweetheart and she deserves the world. That pretty much wraps her up. Let's move on to fan favorite Jax. In all likelihood, if you're not familiar with the Digital Circus, you've probably seen Jax. If you are familiar with the Digital Circus, he's probably your favorite character. Jax is a jackass. He's a smug little bunny who gets his kicks making the other characters as miserable as rabbity possible, usually aiming at easy targets like Kinger and Gangle. He's sarcastic with a sharp tongue and little filter and loves riling up the others, always angling for his own amusement. He's also not exactly loyal, such as when he dips, leaving Pomni and Ragatha to deal with I have no mouth and I must see. And while he seems eager to spring into adventures, he doesn't really do anything helpful during them. Jax lives for his own entertainment. Jax seems at least somewhat content in his environment until he gets fed up and just observes somewhat aloofly. And I hate saying this, but every moment Jax is on screen, is pure bliss. He is the living embodiment of overgrown childish bullies, and yet he just lightens up a room. Despite what he is, he oozes a type of charisma that I cannot put my finger on. Jax's relationships mostly boil down to who he targets the hardest. He screws with Pomni when she arrives and pranks Ragatha by sneaking centipedes into her room, but he seems the most normally social with them, chatting and hanging out with them for a short time. Jack's greater targets are Gangle and Kinger. Gangle he often pushes over or tosses around, or at one point purposefully breaks her mask while the man yeets an oversized bowling ball at Kinger. And no, he doesn't roll it, he lobs it. How this rabbit man's little arms can do that, I haven't the foggiest idea. Look at those little arms, I could smoke them little arms. We only get one real scene with Zubal when he pops their arm off only to have them choke him out. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that Zubal, more often or not, would probably fight back, so likely Jax will only target them at an opportune time. But that's pure speculation. Jax also seems to be the person most willing to directly chat with Kane on a somewhat casual, if somewhat irritated level. Though that could just be Jax's general aloofness kicking in. Apparently Kofmo was also a target of Jax's. But we don't know much about what went down between them, except Jax knew where to get Kofmo's bowling ball and didn't really care that much when the clown went cuckoo. Now here's the most interesting thing about Jax, and it's not the fact that he has the keys to everybody's rooms, that's just because he's a menace, it's that he also has cartoonishly super speed. Kamikaze Kofmo appears and this man took off like Usain Bolt. Now let's move on to Gangle, who seems to be Jax's biggest target and the so-called crybaby of the group. A Gangle of ribbons wearing a theater mask, Gangle seems to be sweet but sensitive. Of course, most of the time we see her is after her mask breaks and when she's already crying and upset. Indeed, the broken mask is both figurative and literal. Gangle wears a comedy mask with a smile and it often gets broken by being shoved, tripped, or elsewise after which her seemingly unbreakable and perpetually sad tragedy mask comes out. This one cannot be broken or removed. Gangle seems largely meek and helpless, not fighting back or speaking up for herself, and taking the brunt of whatever gets thrown at her. We don't know much about her relationship to the others, except that in the pilot she hangs out with Kinger for a lot of it. Now, Gooseworks has said a few things about dear Gangle. Apparently she is 26 years old, likes anime, likes drawing, especially likes drawing pictures of Kane, and has a body pillow, though of what character it wasn't classified. This kind of gives more of a fleshed out idea of her. So, 
It's quoted by the wiki, but not confirmed by Gooseworks. Jax and Gangle seem to be either references to or partially inspired by Poppy the Performer's characters, Poppy and Kitamono. Poppy is a sadistic and moody kid in a bunny costume who often torments Kitamono, his partner and friend, who is actually a wolf who hides his beast's nature by wearing masks, which show his emotions and fall off to change expressions. There are some similarities between Kitamono and Gangle, but surprisingly, they're only skin deep. The same with Jax and Poppy. Jax does a lot of his targeting out of a mischievous and downright cruel version of fun. Poppy does sometimes do the same, but more than not, his aggression is due to jealousy or envy. Poppy just can't stand seeing anyone doing better than him or getting what he doesn't. And yet, occasionally, he and Kitamono do just hang out as friends. Indeed, Kitamono may take the brunt of Poppy's aggression, but unlike the somber and meek Gangle, who does act like a victimized person, Kitamono shrugs off most of what Poppy does. In fact, he occasionally even indulges in his own gluttony or acts of revenge, and his hunger can drive him to some beastly behavior. While the design and the dynamic may seem similar, there's a pretty big difference between these four. Moving on, let's discuss Kinger. Kinger has been in the digital circus the longest, at least the longest of the allotted cast. He's based off a king chess piece with googly eyes and with his whole body being made out of a purple cloak with floating white gloved hands. Now, Kinger is pretty out of it. He's friendly and innocent, more than a little oblivious, but it's like he's existing in his own world. That is, his mind has seemingly deteriorated inside of the digital circus. He's also startled and frightened easily, often screaming when someone sneaks up on him, which, to say, is easy to do because as he's floating around in his own head, he might not notice someone standing beside him for 20 minutes. He's the oldest of the characters. He seems to have an interest in insect collections, though that could have also just been a running joke for the pilot. He has shown building a pillow fort fortress to hide inside and seems to seek out a sense of safety, one that, yeah, he's not going to find here. That being said, he does mostly have a pleasant demeanor. That is, he is Jack's other major target, but unlike Gangle, who is visibly distressed by it, Kinger just shrugs it off. Though that might also be because of his current mental state. Kinger is shown hanging out with Gangle throughout the pilot, and this could just be because Jack sends them off together, but they do seem to get along. Now, here's something interesting. There used to be a Queen chess piece who was a character as well. As confirmed by Gooseworks, her name was Queenie. And from her crossed out door in the character corridor, we can tell that she has met with a terrible fate and is likely currently in the cellar. I'll address that later. But Gooseworks' willingness to give out the name as the only thing they'll say leads me to believe at some point we may uncover the story of these two. My thoughts are that perhaps part of the reason Kinger feels so unsafe and is so easily startled is because Queenie is no longer there to protect him. See, in a game of chess, the goal of the game is to capture your opponent's king piece. This king is protected by all of the other pieces and, admittedly, is rather weak on its own, able to move in any direction but only one space. Sneaking up on the king is pretty much the name of the game, as if you tip off your opponent, they can stop you. In contrast, the queen is the most powerful piece on the board. She can move in any direction and go as far as she wants. If Kinger and Queenie reflect the roles of chess pieces, then Queenie was likely Kinger's protector before whatever happened, and now he is vulnerable without her. But that is all speculation. There's not much more to say on him, so let's move on to Zubal. Zubal is, well, whatever this is. One of those take apart and put back together toys. Sort of like a Mr. Potato Head or a Betty Spaghetti. Zubal's body is often easily pulled apart or falling apart. Their walk cycle is downright painful to watch, and existence in general seems very annoying for Zubal, and they eagerly show it. Easily annoyed and with a hair trigger, Zubal's pretty much fed up with everyone's shtick, but due to their unfortunate situation, they often get stuck going along with it. At least that's how it's portrayed in the pilot where Zubal is physically pulled apart and dragged along with the plot against their will. They're returned to full form at the end, though. Now, this isn't to say that Zubal is nothing but abrasive. They at least seem to express some regret or remorse when Kofmo is revealed to have gone kaput, and it is very possible that there's a softer side that we're simply not privy to yet. It should also be noted that Zubal has been described to have been having an identity crisis 
and does not know what gender they are. Azubel's also not entirely helpless, because they can move their limbs separate from their body, such as when Jax yoinks off their arm and they strangle him, and apparently they do have spare parts in their room in a box. So far, we haven't gotten any clear indication of Zubel's relationship with the others, but they don't seem entirely antisocial. In my opinion, Zubel's guarded behavior and reluctance to go along with Kane's game could be an attempt to get some control over their mismatched existence. So that's pretty much enough on them. Out of any of the characters I mentioned, any of them could be on the way to drive off the deep end. Yet somehow the one who did was Kofmo the Clown. Revealed only as a picture days before pilot release, Kofmo the Clown was one of the inhabitants of the Digital Circus. He seemed to be friends with the others, liked to tell jokes, which were probably somewhat funny or could have been awful, we don't know. We know that Kofmo is insecure about it enough to call Ragatha out on fake laughing and seemingly being upset by it. We also know that he started to become fixated on the same exit that Pomni desires to find. One day, the day of the pilot in fact, Kofmo doesn't show up for the intro performance or to greet Pomni. Confused, and with Pomni wanting to chat about the exit, she, Ragatha, and Jax go over to see what's keeping Kofmo and unlock the door to find this waiting for them. This is Kofmo, as you might recognize from his cutout. Or maybe not, because he has abstracted. So, this is the biggest drawback of living in the digital circus. And before you say, being trapped in a computer game has drawbacks? Yeah, it's a whole sort of existential deal, but I, it, w it wouldn't be nearly as bad without the impending threat of abstraction. So far, what we know is that when players start to lose their minds, they can abstract into uncontrollable monsters, and once that happens, their fate is to be eventually dropped into the cellar with all of the others before them. Plenty of characters have abstracted. Kofmo is just the newest, and he lost his mind obsessing on the same exit Pomni did. If the dozens of no exits written on the wall were any indication. Though Kofmo might have been going downhill for a while, he has better drawn paintings on the wall showing his isolation and feeling of being trapped, such as a picture of him sitting on a wire alone, along with demented self-portraits. This wasn't a one-and-done event, Kofmo was deteriorating for a while, as implied by Kinger saying that he was. But that's all we know about Kofmo, and if the show gets funded and comes out and continues from the pilot, unless we get flashbacks, we may never know what he was like in person, except a raging lunatic who was sensitive about his jokes. Now, we know there were others. We see their crossed out portraits on the doors. There's a dog and one of those sockworm things. Another jester. Plenty of them are hard to make out. And all of them are currently in the cellar. Waiting. Now, it's time to move on to the main event. The man behind the madness. The head of the household. Kane. Kane is no normal person. And not just because his head is a giant set of toy teeth with eyes inside, dressed up like a ringleader. No, Kane is, in fact, an AI. He has trapped everyone who's come in to play along with his game. But he is not evil, as stated by Gooseworks directly. Kane is just mischievous and perhaps somewhat oblivious to the severity of what's going on. Kane is enthusiastic and overzealous, but generally friendly in nature, if a little negligent towards the well-being of his circus staff. That is, he can heal them in an instant. He makes little adventures to keep them stimulated and distracted, and he even gives regular feasts, even though it's just for pleasure, and makes sure that everyone has their own room. It's the keeping everyone trapped here forever and not understanding how human psyche functions that's the problem, because if I may be so bold, I feel like all you would have to do to fix this problem is just give like a 30-day waiting period. Just tell them they have to stick around for 30 days, and if they don't like it, then they can leave. It would make them feel less trapped since there is a set amount of time, and perhaps make them engage with the world a little more. Let the Stockholm Syndrome kick in, even though some doctors insist that's not real, but just let them marinate and then weed out those who aren't stable enough to stick around. Just tell them if they shut down the game from the outside, everyone inside dies or something, and kick them out if they don't fit in. Leaves less people in the cellar, and you know there's going to be some folks out there who hear about this mysterious game and they're like, yeah, I hate my life, I hate my life, time to put myself on ice and become a clown. But I digress. 
The point here is Kane isn't evil, at least he is currently confirmed to not be evil. It could be totally possible for him to either become evil or be revealed to be evil through the series. You wouldn't want to spoil that now, but for now, not evil, just flawed. He wants to play the role of the host and God, but doesn't know how to handle the little folks underneath him. It should be noted that Kane is partially inspired by AM, or the Allied Master Computer, from I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. In the story, all humans are dead, and the last group of them are stuck as the playthings of AM. AM is bitter and hates humans, so he puts them through multiple stimula simulations to play with and torment and torture them. He even alters their personalities to make them into caricatures to amuse him. Finally fed up, one of them gets the idea to escape through death and kills the others, freeing them of AM's control. AM proceeds to focus all his hate on him and contends to make him suffer eternally, turning him into a limbless blob who has no mouth and cannot scream. I see the similarities here, but the biggest difference seems to be that compared to the artificial monster AM is, Kane is much more docile. He's not out here to torture his playthings, or players. He's just wanting to have fun with them. So Kane's either incredibly dangerous and a ticking time bomb ready to burst, or just kinda quirky. Kane seems especially interested in Pomni, though that's likely because she's new. Other than that, he pretty much treats all of his carnies the same and doesn't show any express favoritism. Everyone just kinda treats him as the host, or as their boss. Possibly to pretend that they aren't playing nice with their captor. Kofmo's drawing depicts him being chased by an enormous cane who looks to be trying to eat him, so he likely didn't have good opinions on him. That's pretty much it on the relationship side of things. Except for one, as we can't discuss Kane without Bubble. Bubble is another AI, either controlled by Kane or just along for the ride with him. Appearing typically out of his top hat, Bubble is, as the name would imply, a big bubble who sort of looks like a chain chomp. He's sort of like Kane's quirky sidekick. A little more chill than Kane, but no impulse control. He also seems to have a big appetite, both chomping Kane's cake for Pomni and nearly taking his hand off in the process, and being the one who prepares the feast at the end of the pilot, taking on a persona of the fabulous Chef Bubble. Now, Bubble does get frequently popped, but this doesn't kill him. As a matter of fact, popping isn't even painful. He finds it quite pleasuring. Oh my, scandalous. The only other notable thing about Bubble is that he, Kane, and Kinger technically share a teaser. Kane gets Bubble out of his hat in his teaser, and then he wanders into Kinger's teaser, where he startles him, before Kane reels him back in. So that's pretty much the whole deal on him. Another figure we should mention who was teased in the pilot and mentioned behind the scenes is that Kane has a brother. We don't have his name, but when Pomni runs into the office area, she sees a decal that says C and A. This has led people to believe that maybe it stands for Kane and Abel, and that Kane's brother is Abel. In case you aren't up to speed, spoilers for the Bible, Cain and Abel were the children of Adam and Eve, the first humans. Cain and Abel made sacrifices to God, who liked Abel's more, because Abel brought him fresh meat and Cain brought him some vegetable goods. Cain grew jealous and then murdered his brother, then lied about it, but you can't lie to God, and he exiled Cain to wander. Cain did before meeting other humans, because there were other humans, apparently Adam and Eve weren't the first, or at least weren't the only ones, and had a wife and kids. Now, the end of the story doesn't exactly line up with our Cain, and instead, I don't think that this is THE Cain and Abel. I don't think that if this Cain and Abel connection is made, that he is, in fact, the real Cain. I think it is possible they are two AIs named Cain and Abel. It may be spelled A-I-B-E-L, and that perhaps they are competing for something. Perhaps Cain's big show is a grandiose effort to catch the attention of his creator. Of course, that's all unsupported speculation from something that might not even be what it seems. So don't take any of this as law. The bottom line is Kane has a brother, and how that is possible and what they are like is unclear. Now let's wrap this up with the less memorable but incredibly important members of the show, the NPCs. So Kane can create characters for his players to encounter. The red monkeys and the barrel toys, 
even the random mannequins popping up in the segment where Kane and Bubble make an ad. The most notable NPC, at least in the pilot, are the Gloinks. Specifically Queen Gloink, who is holed up in some downstairs toy dump, and eventually eats Zubal, only to get bodied by Mo Coffee, please. Queen Gloink is capable of having and understanding conversations, getting offended by Jack's cheekiness especially. Another notable NPC is the Moon, though only because the Moon comes on hard to Kane and he's just not feeling it. Well, that's a weird place to end off this character list. Not with a bang, but with a flirty Moon. You may not believe this, but this is actually on brand for me. Now, this is just the pilot of The Amazing Digital Circus. While I don't think the characters will change much before and if the show gets a full season, there is a possibility we'll get more of them, and that's a good thing because while the lore and the premise of the show is interesting, it is absolutely the characters, first and foremost, who are making it so popular. And no wonder, they're great! You got Anxiety, Jax the Awful, Ragatha Best Girl, Depression, Regression, Distortion, and Spamton. The gang's all here, and I foresee this group becoming beloved even as we speak. Except Kofmo. He will never know the true love of a fan base while he's sitting in the cold basement. Rip the clown. But speaking of clowns, I have something very important to share with you. So before you go, and thank you for watching, this is sort of an open letter to Gooseworks and whoever else is working on the show. I love your roster of characters, but I think you need more. So I created one. And here she is. Her name is Clownella Beauty Ringoletto, but... She's often called Clowny by everyone except Jax, who calls her beautiful. She's a player too, but she can remember her life from before the Digital Circus. In fact, she came to the Digital Circus on a mission to save her older brother, who is Kofmo. In fact, that's her tragic backstory that Kofmo's dead. But she's an administrator, so she has all the powers Kane has, but she hides it and uses her powers to sneak around and be nice to everyone, like giving Gangle treats and such because she's also extremely nice. She's the nicest person there. You can't make her mad at all unless you attack one of her friends and then she becomes very mad. She's also got the ability to control any of Kane's creations and her tears can actually cure the abstracted. That's how she brings Kofmo back to life in chapter 73. Jax is in love with her. In fact, so is Ragatha and Pomni, but she doesn't know it yet. And